We've got coffee. We've got questions. Let's do this. Hi, I'm your host, John McQuay, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions here today. We're going to get rolling into this thing. First one is off of YouTube. Karmus54 asks, what's your preferred distance when load testing, 50 or 100 yards? Well, it's going to depend on what kind of load testing you're doing. I prefer ladder testing right now. It seems to get me the best results for the least number of rounds fired. And when I ladder test, I'll actually ladder test at 200 to 300 yards. That gives me a little bit more spacing in between each of the different charge weights and allows me to get a little bit more meaningful results out of my testing. Uh, a lot of guys load test at 100 yards because they're afraid of the wind skewing the results. When you load test at 200 or 300 yards, all you're looking for is the vertical dispersion. You don't so much care how far the group spreads horizontally. Uh, just worry about the vertical and check it that way. Uh, if you're doing some different load testing, you may need to bring it in a little bit closer to get better results, but for a ladder test, uh, 200 to 300 on a 308 works better. Uh, the further you can push it out, the further apart those charge weight differences will be, and the easier it'll be to see when that node comes together and you get an accuracy node. So test where you get the most effectiveness out of it. If you're doing a ladder test, I say 200 to 300 yards. Formerly known as 07 asks, Just wondering, when you run a boar snake, how many rounds do you generally fire on a day trip? If I go out and send 10 rounds downrange every weekend and use a boar snake after each trip, is that going to hurt everything? Well, when I go out and shoot, I'm generally running anywhere from 50 to 100 rounds. Um, I'll run the boar snake through, and when you pull the boar snake out, you'll see this little puff of carbon come out of the muzzle when the snake pops out at the end of it. That's all we're trying to do is just knock that loose carbon out. We're not really trying to do any deep cleaning. When I say I run a boar snake through, that's exactly what I mean. I run it through once. Just one pull through, ball up the snake, throw it back in its bag, and we're done. Um, I hesitate to say that running a snake through once every week is going to cause any damage to your rifle. Now the key to the boar snake is when you pull it through you want to pull it straight through. You don't want to pull it to one side or the other because then you're running that cord over the edge of your crown. And if you're running the boar snake through very often and you're really pulling that cord across the crown each time, after a couple of years you may end up with a little bit of wear on one side or the other. So make sure you're pulling it straight out. But you figure if you're pulling it through once a week that's 52 times a year. That's going to be a quite a few years before you actually start to get any kind of appreciable wear from something as you know low abrasive as the boar snake. So I wouldn't worry about pulling it through just once after each range trip. I wouldn't go any more uh, in depth than that. Ford VG asks, "Do you ever shoot your AR-10 in the matches you shoot in?" I'm looking at 6.5 Creedmoor for DPMS and a second one from either POF USA or Black Rain Ordnance. Well, Ford, I do shoot my AR-10. Uh, it's chambered in 308, and it's actually a custom build. It's running a Noveski barrel. It's not a, a factory barrel in it, but it's uh, pretty accurate. It gets done what I need to get done. I've won a couple of matches with it. Um, a I don't have any experience with the DPMS 6.5 Creedmoors. Um, I've talked to a lot of DPMS owners and uh, they shoot the 308s and really love them and find them to be uh, considerably accurate. Um, I have mixed feelings about the DPMS rifles, but until I actually get a chance to get one and just beat the trash out of it, um, I can't really give you any meaningful feedback on it other than secondhand information. And I really don't like to pass along secondhand information. Um, I have shot the POF 308s, and uh, they are fairly accurate. Um, I got uh, beaten pretty badly at some matches before by the 6.5 POFs, so I 
don't think you'll have any kind of problem at all uh, with the accuracy out of a 6.5 POF. Um, so I think that's probably a good option for a match rifle where you're able to shoot the semi-autos. Of course, in the end, it's going to come down to the shooter and uh, how well you can drive that thing. Mr. Matt Pex 2010 asks, What's your opinion on the Howa 1500s? They're very popular here in Australia, yet seem fairly unknown in America from what I've seen. Well, there was a, a big push for the Howa 1500s a while back as a good budget option. Um, they seem to be fairly accurate rifles. I don't have any because I just have a ton of Remington 700s. Um, the Howa 1500s are, are kind of an odd duck. They use a similar system to the or similar pattern to the Remington 700, but the parts really aren't cross compatible with them. Um, what I would say is if you can get an extremely good deal on a Howa, and you intend to keep it fairly close to its factory configuration, go for it. Uh, however, if you are intending to have it accurized and have a new barrel put on it later on and drop it into some different stocks and all that kind of different thing, you're going to be better off going with a Remington 700 uh, just because the money, the extra money that you spend on the actual action or the barreled action itself is going to give you quite a few more options uh, later down the road. Um, a lot of times in this game we really get hemmed up into trying to pinch pennies and, and save a couple of bucks here and there. It ends up hurting you down the road because you can't do what you want to do with the rifle without a great deal of expense. So if you're just going to buy one of the uh, Howell 1500 Varmint rifles and shoot it until you wear it out, go for it. Uh, they seem to be pretty accurate. If you're going to get it and use it as a base to build on, uh, your options are going to be limited compared to a 700. Dino Turn 1985 asks, What's your opinion on building a precision rifle off an old Millsurp action? I've got an old Enfield and I love the action and I'm considering trying to do something with it. Well, that kind of comes back to uh, something similar to the Howa question. Uh, if you are really emotionally attached to that rifle and you really want to do something with it, then by all means, go for it. Um, however, if you are really wanting to build a top-notch precision rifle on it, I don't think you're going to end up ahead at the end of the game. I think you would be much better off just buying a custom action and going from there. Because the price difference between a custom action and what you're saving on your uh, Millsarp action really is not going to help you down the road. Um, even if you just decided to go buy a uh, Remington 700 action and start from there, I think that money you invest in a more standardized action is really going to help you out with your parts choices and with the reliability of the system down the road. Now, the, the Enfield is a, a great rifle. Um, I just, uh, I think we need to consider it for what it was designed to be. And in the end, you need to stop and ask yourself if it's a really good idea, why don't we see tons of them out there? I mean, every now and again, someone will have a really good idea that no one's thought of before. But in this case, I have a feeling that you're not seeing a whole lot of custom rifles built off that action just because you're limiting yourself to what you can do with it. So if you just want to have fun with it, roll on. Uh, if you want to build a competitive top-notch rifle, I think I would start with a different action. The Stephen McDonough asks, I'm based in Ireland and have a Remington 700 308. What are the best ways to engage unknown distance game and wind calls while hunting without a laser range finder or a mini weather station? Well, if you don't have a laser range finder or the weather station, and obviously on game, you're not going to have a whole bunch of time to sit and do range estimation with a mill reticle. What I would suggest you do is something that we do in the professional field, and it's called a range card. Uh, what you'll actually do is when you get into your position, you'll sit down and make a little sketch of the area that you see in front of you. And then you'll mark out distinct points, like say if you have a tree standing in the middle of a field. Uh, 
Uh, you'll mark that tree and gauge your range to the tree either with range estimation or with a map recon and determine how far you are from that tree. So then you'll mark out on your uh, range card where that tree is and what the range is to the tree. Say you'll have a stream running through, you'll mark where the point is on that stream that's easily distinguishable and what the range is to that stream. And you do this through several points in your field of view. Through that, you'll be able to determine if, say, your stream is at 300 and your tree's at 400 and you see an animal that you want to engage that pops up between the stream and the tree, you can guesstimate that it's about 350 yards. Uh, either apply your hold or apply your dial for that range and engage. Um, it's a very cheap, very simple way to set out your area. And if you hunt in the same spot every time, then just laminate that range card and keep it with you. That way every time you go out there you're not rebuilding your work each time. You can just pull that card out, look at it, and be good to go. Um, that would be my suggestion if you're not able to do a laser range finder. Now even if you have a laser range finder at your disposal, I would say when you get into position, go ahead and laze all that stuff and draw a range card out anyway. Um, it's going to help you, it's going to be faster than fiddling around with that stuff. And while it may not give you a extremely precise range, um, if you do enough points on your range card and you're detailed enough on it, then it's going to get you close enough to engage a target at reasonable hunting distances. Um, again, I won't get into the whole long range hunting thing. Um, you have to know where your skill set is and know what you can reasonably engage an animal at with a high percentage of chance that you're going to drop it right there. Um, so give the range card a try. Now, as far as the mini weather station, if you have a smartphone, um, here in the U.S. at least, there are tons of apps where you can get your environmental uh, variables from a close weather station. Um, usually, uh, if you're pulling off of uh, like the Weather Channel app, uh, they'll pull from the closest airport around you. Uh, so, if you're fairly close to an airport or fairly close to the weather station that your app is pulling off of, then you can get the environmental variables from there and that will be accurate enough for hunting. I know quite a few guys that don't bust out the kestrels, they use uh, a app in their phone for their ballistic variables and they'll just punch the button and tell the uh, app to pull it down from the closest weather station. Uh, so give that a try. Uh, if not, you know, you may just have to log into the computer and you may have to check your variables before you leave for the day and hope that gets you close enough throughout the day. Tactical Wannabe asks, I'm sorry if you've already answered this question, but what are your thoughts on barrel break-in on a precision bolt gun? Gil McMillan seems to think it's a waste of time and barrel. Do you find any difference in accuracy breaking in a barrel compared to not breaking it in? Well, my belief runs uh, quite a bit similar to what Gail McMillan's posted in the past. Um, obviously, he's passed on now, so I can't very well uh, contact him and get his one-on-one -on -one opinion for it. And he's got quite a bit more experience in the barrel making and shooting area than I do. But uh, he seemed to believe that uh, break-in was for the most part something that barrel manufacturers tell their customers so that they can sell more barrels. Uh, think about it, if you spend 10% of a barrel's life shooting bullets down trying to break it in, then that's 10% quicker that you're going to be ordering a new barrel. And barrel manufacturers are going to sell 10% more barrels. So that was pretty much his take on it. Uh, I'm paraphrasing uh, very, very uh, narrowly on that. But my belief goes uh, somewhat similar to that. If it's a factory barrel, um, there is nothing you're going to do by running a patch, two patches, three patches, or 20 patches down the barrel between each shot that you're not going to do by just pulling the trigger again. Um, if it is a custom tube, all the break-in uh, should have been done for the most part by the barrel manufacturer. Now, when they run the reamer in the barrel, it will leave a little bit of a burr at the throat. And the argument on break-in is that you're trying to knock that burr down without leaving very many copper deposits in the barrel. 
I don't so much believe that it's something that's necessary for you to do. Now, on the flip side of things, if you really, really desire to break in a barrel, all you're wasting is time if you're using the appropriate cleaning gear. If you're using a rod guide, if you're using a coated rod, the proper jags or the proper brushes, then you're not putting too much extra wear on the barrel by actually cleaning in between each shot for the first 10 shots, 20 shots, 50 shots, whatever you want to do. Um, it's not going to be that big of a deal. However, to me, my time is worth more than the cleaning supplies or the tiny bit of barrel life that you're expending. Uh, I would much rather just shoot the barrel and get it done. Um, within the first you know, 20 to 100 rounds, you're going to break that barrel in. When you get up into 1,000, 2,000 rounds, uh, you've smoothed the barrel out as smooth as it's going to be. Um, part of the thing that we're trying to do by not cleaning the barrel every time you go out to the range and shoot it is allow that copper to fill in the pores in the barrel and all the uh, rough spots and allow it to smooth the barrel out and, and keep it good to go. So just keep that in mind. Uh, when it comes right down to it, if you think that uh, breaking in the barrel by some magical process is going to make you shoot better, go ahead and do it. Shooting's a 50%, at least a 50% mental game. So if you have higher confidence in your equipment, then you're more likely to be putting good shots downrange. Just make sure if you decide to follow some kind of break-in procedure that you're not cheating yourself, you're using a rod guide, you're using a good quality coated rod like the Dewey rods that we mentioned in the last episode, that you're using a proper jag and that you're not leaving solvent in there or leaving oil in there and you're not running a bullet down a wet bore. Um, so keep that in mind. For me, I just take them out of the box. I clean the barrel the first time to make sure there's no uh, residue from manufacturing in it, and then I'll send rounds downrange. Um, that's all I need to do. That's all I've ever found necessary. Now, if you're watching this and you're a bench rest shooter, do whatever the bench rest champions do. Um, I'm not a bench rest shooter. Uh, it would be stupid of me to tell you, as a bench rest shooter, how to play your game. So. Do whatever the top shooters in bench rest are doing and uh, follow them. In the bench rest game, you're talking group sizes in the teens. Um, that is nowhere near the accuracy necessary for tactical rifle shooting. And I'm a tactical rifle shooter. I don't find any benefit in breaking a barrel in. Gilberto Padilla asks, I have a Bell & Carlson M40 stock on my M700 rifle. Would there be a noticeable accuracy difference in either bedding the stock or switching to a high-end Manners or McMillan? If not, then what justifies the cost? We've got to break your question down in a couple of different parts. First of all, you may or may not see an accuracy difference in bedding your Remington 700 into your Bell & Carlson stock. Um, it's not a question I can answer specifically with a yes or no. Uh, simply because we're dealing with factory rifles and factory stocks. Um, the last part of your question about what the price difference is between the two. Um, when you are paying for a Macmillan or Manor stock, you're paying for a higher level of quality and you're paying for higher level materials. Um, the materials that are used to construct a Manor's or Macmillan are quite a bit different from a Bell & Carlson. Um, that's where the money's going into the better materials and into the hand laid uh, process and the extra quality control checks that you're getting with those stocks. Now, if you decided to go with a Manners or McMillan stock, uh, you're still going to need to bet it to get the most out of it. Neither Manners nor McMillan uh, offer a bedding block outside of the Manners mini chassis. Uh, if you ordered a Manners with a mini chassis into it, that actually is a bedding block, trigger guard, and magazine system combined. Uh, and that doesn't require any bedding at all. You simply drop your action in and bolt it down. The McMillan, you can order them with pillars already installed. However, you're still going to need to bed it to get the most accuracy out of that rifle system. So with your current setup, with the 700 and the Bell and Carlson stock, if you think you're going to see an accuracy gain, bet it. Um, properly bedded rifle is not going to reduce the accuracy. So at worst, you may have wasted some time and a little bit of materials and gotten no gain. 
Um, at the best, you may see an increase in accuracy uh, betting the rifle. So there's really nothing to lose other than a little bit of time and a little bit of materials by doing it. Now, obviously, if you improperly bed the rifle, you can reduce the accuracy. So if you don't feel comfortable in doing the job on your own, take it to a gunsmith and have a gunsmith do it for you. Jay Kalnan asks, do you ever shoot using a sling for support? Do you have any recommendations as to a sling that would be good for this on the budget build Remington 700? Well, I've got a couple of sling recommendations, but I think I'm going to hold them until next week. Uh, next week, I hope to cover some slings and hope to bring you something a little bit different in the sling arena that we've been working on. Um, so hold that question. Uh, we'll hit it next week and hope to show you something. On Facebook, Shane Delange asks, when choosing a scope, is it better to choose a one inch tube or a 30 millimeter tube and why? Also, what are the pros and cons of a bigger 56 millimeter versus smaller 40 millimeter objective lens? And is there such thing as going too big? Well, Regardless of what the girls tell you, there actually is a case of too big. Uh, too big of an objective lens is when you're no longer able to get the appropriate cheek weld. Uh, if you're shooting something like a traditional stock where you have a non-adjustable comb, if you go too big on that objective bell, you start pushing your cheek higher and higher off the stock until you actually end up with a chin weld. Uh, a chin weld is not conductive to good accuracy. You won't get that eyeball in the exact same position behind that scope every single time. And the reality of the situation is how many guys out there are actually shooting at twilight? They're out there in the middle of the night trying to use all available light to shoot. That's really when those great big huge lenses come into effect. Uh, it gives you a brighter sight picture at the same magnification setting versus a smaller objective lens. Uh, during the day uh, you'll find that you know, a 40 millimeter objective lens is more than enough if you're using a quality optic. Now, what I seem to see as we go down into the lower quality optics is they compensate for poorer glass by using a larger and larger objective to try to brighten up that sight picture. So if you compare, say, a 44 millimeter um, US optics to a 56 millimeter uh, BSA or a Tasco, then you're going to see a, a little bit of a difference in the sight picture. You're going to see that even though the USO has a smaller objective, it's going to be a brighter sight picture. Now, back to your question on the tube diameter. Um, the old myth is that a larger tube allows more light to pass. This is totally and completely incorrect. The amount of light that is allowed through the optic starts with the objective lens. Um, by the time it comes back and passes through the erector assembly, which is inside the scope tube, it's narrow. It's not, it's not being affected by the diameter of that tube. Obviously, if you crank that tube down to a pinprick size, that's going to affect it. But for our purposes, what the tube diameter is affecting is the distance of travel that the internal assembly has to move. So on if all else is equal, and that's the key thing here, is you have to compare apples to apples. If all else is equal, a 30 millimeter tube is going to give you more elevation and windage travel than a one inch tube. Sometimes that's not the case because it's still the manufacturer that's putting the parts inside the tube. Uh, 30 millimeter tends to be the standard right now for tactical rifle scopes. Uh, when you choose a 30 millimeter tube, you have the largest variety of mounting hardware, mounts, rings, etc., to use on that scope. Uh, when you get into the 34 and 35 millimeter scope tubes, uh, you gain travel, but you also are limited by uh, some of the mounting options out there. Uh, also, the opposite direction, going down into the one inch tubes, uh, you start to limit the mounts that are available, although uh, you, in most cases, you can use the 30 millimeter to one inch tube adapters to use a 30 millimeter mount on a one inch tube. Uh, if you're going with something special and you're using a budget placeholder scope, get a one inch scope and use one inch tube adapters to use it in a 30 millimeter mount, and that will give you options to move up later on. But 
If I'm looking at a scope right now, mainly look at 30 millimeter tubes uh, unless you have a specific reason to go to the 34 or 35 millimeter tubes. I think we're just going to continue to see this progression where 34 or 35 millimeter will become the standard for a while. Uh, I really honestly hope we don't go a whole lot bigger than that because the larger tubes are also adding larger weight, or I'm sorry, more weight to the system. And in many cases, it's really just not needed. Um, if you can take, for instance, a Night Force F1, and you can get the elevation that you need with a 30 millimeter tube, why do you need a 34 millimeter or 35 millimeter tube? So in that case, you can't go too big. If you're getting uh, more elevation travel than you can possibly use, it's not really uh, going to benefit you. Also on Facebook, Ryan Ryder asks, any advice on a Remington 700 bolt knob upgrade? Do you still have the KRG Ops bolt lift mounted on your budget build? How is it holding up? Uh, well, we no longer have the KRG bolt lift on the budget build, and the simple solution or the simple reason for that is that the budget build is using a standard pistol grip stock, and with the way I grip the standard pistol grip stock, the bolt lift, the larger bolt knobs, rub right on the knuckle of my trigger finger. And if I'm not real careful, then during recoil, I can get that uh, bolt knob smacking my trigger finger, and it's not exactly the most comfortable thing in the world. Uh, it's not exactly painful, but it's also distracting. I don't like to have anything rubbing on my trigger finger when I'm applying pressure on the trigger. So for traditional stocks, I prefer traditional bolt knob because it's out of the way. Now the bolt lift has come to rest on our XLR Evolution rifle that my wife uses to compete with. Um, it is a great option and it's actually worked so well that we really haven't seen any reason to upgrade to a Badger knob or any of the other knobs that are out there. Uh, the bolt lift goes on solid, it stays tight, and if for some reason I decided that I needed to even make it permanent. They include epoxy with it that you can just shoot in there and uh, bond the bolt knob on somewhat permanently. So the uh, if you guys are out there and you're on the fence on what kind of bolt knob you want to use, take a look at the, the KRG bolt lift. Uh, it's an excellent option to test drive a bolt knob and you may find that once you put it on there you don't really need to go to anything else. Um, We'll leave a link down in the description section to our review on the website of the bolt lift. Uh, we may do a video review of it again a little bit later on when things calm down here a little bit, but it is an excellent option. It's fairly inexpensive and it goes on extremely fast. Shay on Facebook asks, I have a question for Mail Call Mondays. What's your take on tripods? Do you prefer clamping heads or a rest slash cradle? I'm sure each serve a purpose, but it would be nice to see a test on which is more versatile slash general purpose based. Well, I've got several here. Uh, I've got uh, my old tripod laying around here somewhere uh, that I made uh, before I went to sniper school. I have a, a PRS tripod that uses a, a cradle covered with a thousand denier uh, Cordura. And then I also have a hog saddle sitting around here, which is actually a heavy-duty billet aluminum clamp type rest. Um, each of them do serve their purposes. Obviously, the Sniper School homemade cradle, it's cheap, it's effective, uh, they almost always break. Rarely would one of those tripods make it through more than one school. Uh, without needing some kind of love, the plastic on them cracks because we usually use pretty cheap tripods when we assemble them because they get spray painted and drug around in the field. Um, the advantage, like I said, they're cheap. Uh, they're quick and easy to construct and at some point we may do a demo on how to build those. However, when we originally started building them, there wasn't anything else out there. There were no options to be able to set up a shooting rest like that. In fact, I think it was even before all the hunters uh, started using shooting sticks and those started popping up in the uh, stores. So we had nothing. We kind of had to uh, invent it from scratch. Now, uh, PRS, they uh, took that idea and moved it a step further and mounted a production cradle to a heavier-duty tripod that will actually last you out in the field. So if you like 
the rifle being able to slide across the rest, then those are the tripods that you can go with. Uh, the advantage of the PRS is it's lightweight, it's easy to transport, it's fast to set up and throw a rifle across it. Um, the disadvantage of it is you have to balance the rifle in that cradle. Um, there's nothing to hold it in there, so if for some reason you got a monkey with your comms or reach down and do something with your data book, um, you have to either hold the rifle, balance the rifle, or take the rifle out of the, cra or out of the cradle. Um, this isn't a key solution to me, but then again, there are quite a few situations where you don't need all that extra stuff. Um, if I was picking a tripod to stalk at sniper school, then I would probably go with the PRS tripod just because of the size, the lightweight, and the speed with which you can set it up. Now the hog saddle is the, the granddaddy of cradles. Uh, it allows you to put a rifle in it, clamp it down, and leave it there in some pretty high winds and it's not going anywhere. Um, you can clamp the rifle into it and bust out a magazine through an AR-10 and stay fairly well on target with it. It is an extremely well-produced, well-thought-out piece of gear. Uh, I use the hog saddle on a Manfrotto heavy-duty tripod. Uh, it adds considerable weight to the system, but what I envision this piece of gear as best suited to is an urban hide, urban type situation, or if you are out in the field where you want to set the rifle up and leave it, and you're not really limited by weight constraints. Now I do want to clarify one thing between the two. The lines kind of blur between the PRS and the hog saddle because you can take the PRS, you can mount it to a heavy duty tripod if you wish. I can take the PRS, unscrew the mounting plate that's on the bottom of it, put a Manfrotto mounting plate on it, and snap it on my Manfrotto tripod. Conversely, I can take the hog saddle, I can put a lighter weight tripod, like a slick tripod, on the bottom of it and have a lighter weight solution to carry around. The reason I don't do this is pretty simple. Uh, when you clamp a rifle into that hog saddle, uh, you want some extra weight on that tripod to hold it and keep it from tipping. Uh, if you put it on a really light tripod, you need to make sure that you have that weight well balanced over it. And some rifles, uh, like my AR-10, it tends to be a little butt heavy uh, if you clamp ahead of the magazine well. So you have to really be careful of where you clamp it in if you're using a lightweight tripod. If I'm using something heavy duty like the Manfrotto, I can throw it in there and not worry about it. Now. The PRS tripod, even if you mount it on a heavy-duty tripod, you still don't have the ability, or the PRS cradle, if you mount it on a heavy-duty tripod, you still don't have the ability to lock the rifle in. However, you need to try your shooting style on each of them. Uh, the grippy material that the hog saddle puts in there kind of prevents it from being used in a free recoil slash sliding fashion. Um, it's a bit grippy, it likes to hang on to things, so I don't think you're going to get the rifle to slide real well in there. The 1000 denier Cordura that they use on the PRS cradle uh, will allow your rifle to slide pretty well, so during recoil you can get that little slip forward and back and uh, not have your tripod bounce around everywhere. We hope to do a little bit more in-depth review of the different tripod options coming up. Uh, I know I keep pushing a lot of videos back, but I've got a lot of stuff sitting here that we got to get reviewed and get back to the manufacturer. So the, the things that we have more freedom on tend to get pushed back a little bit. So we're going to try to get to that. Uh, I have a lot of the video shot for the hog saddle review. I just haven't sat down and wrapped it up. So I hope to get into that really soon. Well, that's it for our questions and answer section today. I've got a new piece of gear that just came in this week from Dennis Adams down in Virginia. This is our completed Accuracy International or Badger M2008 action wrench. Uh, Dennis did an exceptional job on this thing. It's beautifully finished. Uh, it is a matte, almost bead blasted look to it. Uh, he did a couple of different things on it. He moved the keyway further forward. so. On the Accuracy International, the key engages the front of the ejection port. Uh, that way you're not putting uh, more twisting stress on the action than you really need to when you're opening it up. Uh, he put this nice uh, chunk of rubber on the key. 
That way where it engages your ejection port, it won't leave any marks. And because the key is bi-directional here, if you're loosening it, you can put it one way. If you're tightening, you can stick the key the other way so that the piece of rubber is always bearing against the edge of the ejection port that's taking the force. Now you notice we, uh, we had a discussion about tethering the, the keyway. I tend to lose stuff, so dummy cords are a great thing for me. Uh, Dennis went ahead and put this nice uh, rubber-coated steel cable on here to hold your keyway on or your key on so you never lose the key. Uh, there appears to be enough slack in here that it's not going to be any problem at all getting in the way. Uh, it's not too long, which would also get in the way. Attach it just by doing this little uh, groove here ahead of the, the hex wrench or the, uh, the hex portion of the tool. Now, Dennis put a ton of thought into this tool here, especially on how to set up the engagement area to get your wrench on here. Uh, there are several other tools out there that either use an extension that is just welded on or they use a square drive or several different things. Uh, Dennis decided on going with the, the hex drive just because most of us that have tools already have hex sockets. There's no extra reason to reinvent stuff. You're not gaining anything by welding on an extension. And when you weld on an extension, and now you're changing the heat treat of that piece of metal. Uh, he rounded everything perfect. There are no sharp edges on this tool anywhere that I can find. It feels extremely good in the hands. It's a very, very high quality tool. Uh, we're gonna be getting into swapping barrels on our AI to the 243 barrel, and we've held off on it because we were waiting on the finished product. Um, I don't even want to show you the prototype anymore because this looks so much better. He just really took it to the next level. Uh, contact information will be in the comment section below on how to get a hold of Dennis if you want to order one of these up for your Accuracy International or your Badger actions. Uh, it will work with both the long action, it'll work on the AX, the AW, the AI, uh, everything we tried it in, uh, it fits in just fine. Uh, it uh, will also work on the Badger long and short actions. I don't have a Badger here, but I was assured that it will uh, work on those. Uh, Dennis is also starting work on a, a TRG wrench, so we hope to see what he comes up on that. Uh, so give him a call if you need a wrench for your rifle. Well, that's about it for this episode. Hopefully, we'll get this out on time and get it up to you Monday morning. Um, as always, thank you for watching and thank you for your comments. Uh, the show works on questions and comments, so if you have a question for us, please leave it in the comments section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you like this episode, make sure you hit that little thumbs up button below. Liking helps us in our search engine rankings. Uh, if you dislike the video, please leave a comment and tell me why. Um, thank you for your time, and uh, we enjoy doing this episode. As long as you guys are watching it, as long as our views are going up and our subscribers are going up, we're going to keep this thing rolling. Uh, I hope to get you some uh, review videos later this week. Uh, that is the goal, so keep an eye out for those. Remember to subscribe. If you subscribe, then you'll get notified as soon as we release new videos. Uh, subscribing also helps us in our rankings and it helps us demonstrate to manufacturers that they need to send us stuff to test for you. So please click that little subscription button and help us out. Since you guys decided to stick around, I'll show you something that showed up uh, this last week. This is the new Leupold CQB SS Mark 8. It is a 1.1 to 8 power by 24 millimeter uh, close quarter battle optic. It's designed more for a DMR role where you can either dial it down to 1 power to use it for the close range stuff, or you can crank it up to 8 for pretty precision shots. Uh, this one has the MTMR reticle in it, 
which uh, we'll get into detail a little bit later on. Uh, a couple of key features on it. Uh, the power is adjusted on this scope by just grabbing the entire ocular assembly and rotating it, much like a night force scope. Uh, you don't have to worry about fumbling for the tiny magnification ring. You just grab the whole knurled assembly and crank it to whatever power you need it to be. There's still a, a really high raised nub right here so that you can feel where the power is at. You can get your thumb up there to give you some extra purchase to rotate it if it's wet or icy. I uh, thought that was a real neat design. It has a locking ocular adjustment, so once you get that dialed in, you can lock it down and not worry about bumping it or moving it. I'm a great fan of this type of ocular adjustment. I really don't like the, the fast focus eyepieces. I think they're way too easy to get twisted out of position. The most notable feature on the scope, besides the 1 to 8 power magnification range, are the locking turrets. If, you, if the turret is set at zero, you grab it at the three and nine position and squeeze it together and that unlocks it so you, now you can rotate the turret. When you get to your desired dope setting, you just simply release it and now the turret's locked and it won't turn anymore until you push the sides in and rotate it. It also has a zero stop so you don't get lost in the rotations of the turret. You just crank it back and hit your zero stop and there you are. The locking feature is also applied to the windage turret so to rotate your windage, you still have to squeeze in the sides of the turret. I really like how the windage turret on this is marked. It's actually marked with right and left markings. So you can tell when it's rotated which side you're on. And if you get it rotated, it won't actually rotate all the way over. So there's no way for you to go one revolution past. You're always either on left or right. It has uh, illuminated reticle. There are quite a few adjustments on the illumination. We haven't had it out at night yet to see if the reticle blooms or if the adjustment levels are appropriate, but we'll be sure to test that. Overall, this is a really beefy optic. Uh, it really, the construction feel uh, inspires a great deal of confidence in it. I'm really looking forward to getting this on a rifle and getting some rounds down range with it. If you have questions on this optic, please post them in the comments section below or send us a message or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, what we're going to start doing on optics and some of the other gear that we review is I'm going to do an initial overview, much like I'm doing right now, and then I'm going to give you guys the option to ask some questions through the comments section. And then when we do the full review, We'll try to include those uh, or try to answer those questions. I think this will give us a more in-depth review because a lot of times when I'm looking at things, I'm looking at things from a little bit different viewpoint than you, the viewer, may be looking at them. So I really need your input to give a very well-rounded review of the products. So if you have any questions on the CQBSS, uh, please go ahead and post them in the comment section below and we'll get to it. And of course, this will confuse the hell out of any of the guys that didn't watch all the way to the end because they'll be thinking, when did he talk about a rifle scope? So keep up the good work. Remember to subscribe. And now go watch some of our other videos. Thanks. Have a good day.